Hi, everybody. All right, so I'm going to get started. My name is Stephen Tramer. I have given a series of talks about this exact thing from 2014, 2016, and now. Um, when I first pitched this talk, this is the name of it, State of Swift Internals, Swift Form 5. Then I started doing my research, and that name is not great. <laughs> I will not be talking about Swift 5. Uh, instead, I decided that maybe it should be called this. Uh, on the Swift compiler, it's an update to those other talks that I gave over the last few years, because that's what it is. Uh, that's a terrible name for a talk. And the actual way the talk is going to progress is something a little bit more like this, which is Steve reads source and docs, so you don't have to. <laughs> well, you can clap right now, but you haven't seen the next slide, in which I say that uh, you can too. The, um, the big part of this talk, and it turns out, is going to be I didn't really read a lot of the source, even if I read some of the docs. Uh, I wrote compiler output. So this talk is actually going to go through some of the actual written Swift documentation. It's going to go through some of the compiler source code. But most of the time in the talk is actually going to be spent in compiler artifacts. So we're going to spend time in, uh, I think, actually in each stage of the compiler, there's two intermediate languages it makes. And then it also produces assembly. And we're going to look at actually all of it. Uh, this talk and all of the code is going to be available right there on GitHub. So y'all can pull it down and uh, we'll see if I feel bold and to do a live demo, but in reality I will probably not be doing that. I've got stuff on the slides for you. All right. I think that it's important at the start of any talk to kind of give you an idea of why should you care about any of this. So that's where we're going to start. Uh, then we're going to talk briefly about compilation stages. I'm going to introduce you guys to every stage of the Swift compiler. Uh, if you went to my 2016 talk, you'll be familiar with a little bit of it. Then we're going to talk about the meat and potatoes of what all of my talks on the Swift compiler have been about, which is ABI stability. When is Swift going to be ABI stable? When, is, when are other languages going to be able to call into Swift? Uh, Objective-C can do it, which is great, but I would like to be able to call into Swift from C, be able to call in from Go. I would like to be able to call in from Rust. I would like to be able to call in from Java or whatever. Uh, in fact, calling in from Java would be awesome because then you write the back end of your mobile application in Swift, then you ship it on Android and on iOS, and it's great. Uh, Swift does compile for Android. Uh, API stability is made up of several things. The first we're going to talk about is data layouts. This is the part of the talk where I'm going to go most in depth because it turns out that data layouts are by far the most complicated thing that the Swift compiler is doing to your, uh, to your code. And it turns out that in the process of investigating this, I actually found a lot of things that are helpful for guiding you along on your own journey to look through these compiler artifacts to find information you need or are interested in. Then I'm going to go into calling conventions. Calling conventions uh, in general are how do I pass function arguments? How do I get function? How do I get return values out of function? Uh, then I'm going to talk about library guarantees, which are not strictly part of ABI stability, but Swift is doing something very unusual where they want you to be able to explicitly semantic version libraries and APIs within those libraries. And as part of that, they have a guiding document which explicitly says the things you are and are not allowed to do to maintain ABI stability in your libraries between versions. Uh, this is really interesting. I can't think of any other modern language that makes this guarantee. Uh, and then finally, I am actually going to talk about something that's Swift 5.0 just a little bit, because this is a topic I promised in the abstract, and it's a topic that interests me greatly. And it turns out it's already in Swift 4.2, but you can't actually use it. Uh, only the compiler will use it, which is ownership and lifetimes. And then I'm going to close up the talk with the thing that I've persistently been talking about abstractly, and I'm now going to talk about more concretely, which is building a foreign function interface for Swift. All right, so why should you care about any of this?
Apple keeps saying Swift is a systems programming language. At that time, I was actually helping to put together a video supercut of everybody on stage at WWDC saying Swift is a systems programming language, which is not true. Swift is an applications programming language. Swift has ambitions to be a systems programming language. But until we understand where it's falling short right now, then we're not really going to be able to advocate for usage of it as a systems programming language. And understanding what those shortfalls are right now will help you, like, you know, maybe somebody in your company says, SIFT is a system programming language. We're going to write like a back end load balancer in that, and then you can say no. Because that's a terrible idea right now. Uh, demystify compilers. Programmers think of compilers as a mysterious thing that only the smartest people on the planet work on, which is like maybe half true. And but the truth is, it's a program that takes input and generates output like every other program. And Swift is actually a really good study in this because it's open source. And it's open source that is also a competitor against two other major open source languages that are looking to supplant C and C++, Rust and Golang. Uh, Rust and Swift actually have a lot in common. The teams frequently cross-pollinate members and contribute to each other's languages. Um, lifetimes and ownership are actually coming from Rust. Which, if you know about lifetimes and ownership and Rust, you're probably very worried right now, and I will relay those views later. Uh, learn more Swift breaks the long established rules of time. Swift's ABI actually breaks a lot of standard ABI rules that have been around since like the 70s and 80s. Understanding why they chose to break those rules is actually very important. And then ABI stability has benefits, but there's a real difference between being told, we did the thing and it allows you to do this other thing. You want to understand why you did the thing and why the other thing is good. You want to understand whether the implementation of the thing is actually good to get the end result of the other thing. So there are, in fact, lots of bad ways to solve problems to get good outcomes. And then there's one final one, which I think is actually very important, uh, debugging. Sometimes you will come across a bug that you cannot explain, that is absolutely impossible to track down, that you go into the assembler and you start looking at this assembly and you start inspecting the registers. If you understand the calling conventions, if you understand the data layouts, you will know by hand where to look in information to find out what you're missing and what can help you solve your problems. So, by the way, all right, well, we start with Swift. We write code in Swift. Swift compiles into something called Swift Intermediate Language, SIL, which is somewhere between Swift and Assembly. It's a very strange language, and you are going to be seeing a lot of it today. Then that converts into LLVM IR, the intermediate representation assembly language that LLVM takes and compiles into assembly. LLVM IR is also called bitcode. And then, as you would expect, LLVM takes the intermediate representation and turns it into assembly to run on a platform. Uh, and then that assembly gets compiled into multiple binaries. And if you attended an earlier talk today, you know lots of fantastic things to do with those. So how do we actually get the results of these intermediate states? Well, it turns out that Swift C has some flags that there's emit silgen and emit sil to get the Swift intermediate language artifacts. There is actually a difference between these two. You always want to use that one. Second, silgen is what's called non-canonical, and I'm not entirely sure what it is used for in the compiler pipeline, but it is still there. Okay, well, you we can also get intermediate representation. Emit IR. And then I ran out of space on the slide, but you can also emit sil. Cool, you can get all of the intermediate artifacts from Swift C. You do not get them from the regular Swift command, by the way. That made this a little bit of a problem. So, ABI stability. What is it, like, at a higher level? Because I kind of talked a little bit about it, like what it entails, but what is it? ABI stability is about ensuring that two pieces of software built with different versions of the compiler at different times can still link together. Uh, compatible doesn't mean identical. But it means symbol names have changed, data layouts have changed, everything behaves as expected. And more importantly, this allows you to ship binary frameworks 
A big problem with Swift apps right now, which probably a lot of you know, is that the Swift runtime and standard libraries and everything else is compiled into your app binary. Because it's not part of the operating system. There's no ABI. You build with a later version of Swift than is available on somebody's iOS device, or at the time that iOS was released. So your code can't call into those Swift libraries because there's no stable ABI. And that's what ensures the level of compatibility and future proofing required for longevity. Uh, like, let's say that someday in the distant future, there's iOS 15, and you are writing an iOS 15 app that needs to deploy on iOS 13. With ABI compatibility, you can do that. As long as you don't call any source incompatible functions, which would be functions that exist in iOS 15 but not at 13, which is where the Swift availability guarantees primitives come from. Um, and then ABI sets the ability to call into Swift from other languages, not just Objective-C. In fact, the Objective-C calling stuff is part of the current ABI. I'm going to actually talk about this a little bit when we get to the calling convention. So, data layouts. Let's do this. First of all, Swift 4.2 has lots of data layouts. Swift 4.2, Swift 4 it's actually got a lot of locked everything. Almost everything in the ABI is locked. This is why they're claiming they can release Swift 5.0 sometime early next year, because it is probably another six to eight months of work to complete the ABI stability, but 90% of it is there. Uh, in particular, V tables are not locked. So. If you, like me, worked in C++ for a long time or are familiar with dynamic programming in general, vtables are virtual function dispatch tables, which means that if you have a class object that needs to be able to dispatch to more than one possible function, for example, you have a subclass that overrides, the vtable format is not locked right now. Uh, by the way, in today's mock -O talk, I noticed that the vtable stuff is located in the data segment, so you can actually look up those vtables right now and you can probably do mean tricks to overload them. Uh, payloaded enums, so enums with associated data, by which I mean an enum where there's one case that takes a string, an enum where one case takes an int, and so on, those data layouts are not locked down, because those data layouts are incredibly complicated. Uh, and witness tables are locked down. Witness tables are a concept in Swift where, unlike V tables, witness tables relate to protocol. My class conforms to a protocol. The witness table for that class says which protocols I implement and what methods I subscribe to that conform to that protocol. We are unfortunately not going to be talking a lot about witness tables today, although they are very cool. So this is the good starting point, and we're going to look at three levels from top down to determine the data layout, which is what happens in Swift intermediate language. And then when I go from Swift intermediate language, what happens in the intermediate representation. And then finally, we're going to take a look at what the compiler source says. Because there is really only one source of truth with any software, which is the output. Output is the source of truth. Source code can have bugs in it. And in fact, when I went looking in Swift source code, the first thing I saw was a giant fix me. So uh, data layouts in Swift actually have now that needs to be fixed. <laughs> so, all right. Goodness, can you guys actually read that? Maybe? No? Oh, no. All right. Good work. Okay, that's the worst case scenario. All right. So, struct layout. Public, Boolean, public in 64, public in 32, private in 64, private. A naive initialized and initialized all of them, and a couple of functions for good measure. And now the reading is going to get much more difficult because this is not Swift, this is the Swift intermediate language. So the structs are pretty much the same. They have accessors, public, they tell you what the variable name is, it tells you what type it is, it tells you whether or not you can get it and set it. So it's pretty ordinary. Um, and then down here, there is Notice that there's this big thing that's S7, struct 12, struct layout A, 15, struct C layout B, E, which is the name. Name handling is processed by the compiler takes a standard name, uh, which is the namespace plus class name plus function name plus argument types plus etc. 
and matches them all together in a single screen so that you don't get any conflicts. Uh, the reason why Objective-C doesn't have good name spacing and you have to do your own prefixes on everything is Objective-C does not need name name. All right, so we start with, in order to actually check the data layout, we have to instantiate something. So we got this. We're going to put into that struct just some garbage data, essentially the value of one for absolutely every one of those data types. And it's going to come out looking something a little bit like this, which you are absolutely not going to be able to read, because the text is tiny and the colors are not very good. But to kind of give you guys a little bit of a hint about what is located in each of those, I can also make it out, because the printing on my screen is tiny too. I'm very sorry. I tried to fit as much on the slides as I could, and I didn't want to run this live. Um, all right, so we're actually going to kind of go into this a little bit more in depth. Uh, I'm going to isolate some particular statements here and make it easier. But what is happening here in essence is a series of literals are being pushed into their own structs, and then init is called. That's like down, it's down here towards the bottom. You guys can't read that yet because I haven't isolated it. But that's what the actual init call is down there. Uh, and just so probably init tells us a little something about the data layout, because that's what we're interested in here. All right. Well, the init method is very large. And when I say very large, I mean it's doing a bunch of stuff repeatedly over and over that you would expect. Uh, so it's got the arguments here. And you can see I'm very sorry. And it goes through each of these little blocks here. It's kind of looks identical. This is where it fires a uh, write block on the variable. It writes into it and then it stores it. So this is kind of weird towards the very end, which is it copies everything back out of self and returns it. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But it also gives you an idea of how SIL sort of works when you're looking at it. On the far left here, there's little percents followed by numbers. Those are the intermediate results that get cached, and then they get cached along for their own line. And fortunately, the switch to SIL compiler is smart enough to say, like, oh, it uses these things right here. So it's actually quite easy to read. Uh, when I say quite easy to read, what I mean is it's well commented. So now we're actually going to look at the specific function calls and some of the specific data layouts so that you guys can maybe finally read some of this text. Oh man, you can totally read that, that's awesome. All right, so first thing that we do is on the stack, alloc stack struct layout var name self. A, it allocates self on the stack. So, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we know that structs get allocated on the stack. We're good there. Um, and then it starts doing this storage. Each individual store seems to be autonomous because there's this thing called Modify stack for each individual element. It writes into their struct element address, 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 there might be, but it's related to lifetimes and ownership. All right, now there's this really mystifying thing down here at the bottom, which is at the very end, the very tail end, it looks like it reconstructs the struct and then allocates again on the stack and then returns that. So it reallocated everything for some reason. That's very strange. Is that just a call to default initializing? Because we wrote on the stack and then it pulls it off the stack and then puts it in the default initializer because it corresponds to that. Or is there something going on here? Did all of those writes to the stack not write to the result at all? This is actually again, kind of a real mystery. A real mystery. All right, we can solve this mystery. We go into LVMIR, intermediate representation. So 
Once again, we've got our call site where we're creating the struct. And it compiles down into this. It's a lot like this we're going to read later. So, call switches to the avoid and call the initializer. No idea what's going to capture, it tells you what the return register is, blah, 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 blah. There's this thing in here called the bit cast, which is a bit wise cast from into this struct type here, this, uh, the actual address of the thing. This weird thing called struct layout, struct layout UDP, and it casts it to a 64 bit enter, which makes it sound like something is in an out. Uh, in fact, yeah, it's a random copy. So it actually creates two big casts. It casts the result of the initialization to the same thing as the data struct, and then it does a store. All right, cool. It's easy to up. All right, well, how do we know what the actual data layout is? And the answer is writing it here, where it says the basic default structure of the struct is cast. So, now we have this down here. It stores a Boolean, then it stores a packet, then it stores an in 64, then it stores a float, then it stores an in 64, then it stores a double. If you recall back to the first slide where I showed the programmer recognition, this lines up 100% of that, except for the padding. Uh, padding is there for alignment purposes. On 64 bit architectures, it is best to have a 64 bit aligned because it's easier to be built up. Um, there are some situations in which you want to be able to align a single aligner to a aligner. But on um, 64 bit platforms, 64 bit alignment tends to be what happens. So, this raises an important question. This layout is exactly how we laid out the struct. But we also had all our public members at the top, all the private members at the bottom. What happens if we change the order? What happens if I put some private, the private number on top, and then there's some public numbers, and then there's a flat private number at the bottom? Does that change anything? Does that actually change the data layout of the type? Because this is something that Swift is trying to guarantee is that data layouts don't change if you reorder the order of members in struct. Swift considers that to be very important. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, float 64, that's a double, float 32, that's a float, a boolean, that's a boolean, okay, there's a pattern in there. Before we get to the 64 before we get to the 64 it looks like Swift isn't making any API guarantees. It looks like it's just packing data however it wants. So, what's happening? This is happening! Oh my god! So, you may or may not recognize some of this as the image code from way, 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 way. Slide back. There's been this weird thing in the bottom though where it's moving data between what is it declared alignment at the top. The thing that we just went through. Oh no. Slides. Between this thing and the canonical thing that we initially wrote. So it looks like Swift doesn't impose a strict order on the internal type. It looks like Swift doesn't impose an order on what it passes to LLVM as, oh, this is the order of the fields in the object. What it looks like it tries to do instead is take all of those things and move them and realign them so that it fits into what Swift expects for its API, which is, a questionable decision, but there are probably very good reasons for it. People on the compiler team are much smarter. This leads me to have an important question, which is, did I accidentally write that first struct so that it was perfectly ABI aligned? So that Swift would say, oh, I don't need to do anything special to this because it already fits the ABI in terms of how everything is ordered. To figure this out, it's good to be a simple so, first struct for all the public stuff is at the top, all the stuff is at the bottom. All right, cool. That's 41 to 49, that's 80 instructions. That's pretty good. 
Here is the thing that is definitely not ADM in line. This is you know, 17 or something. It's about twice as large. Uh, and you'll see here, this might actually be a little bit easier to make it out because of the colors here. Uh, when it calls into the initializer and you get the return values, it actually does all of the things that are required in And then it re realigns everything because it's moving things around from uh, the return registers that or registers that it's loaded into into what it considers to be the correct place inside of the structure itself. It's very strange. So it seems like the register instruction. Might actually be, uh, actually be trying to do a store function call, which might be the true source of ADI, which would be when it's, it's a store function may actually be generated for each number, right? And what you do with that? This is a thought that just occurred to me looking at this. But we can make some lessons from this, some very important lessons, which are put public members first in your structs. If you care about struct size, alignment, like if you care about doubling the number of instructions in your in naive initializer, put public members first. Try and keep data ordered from smallest to largest. One thing that didn't come out as obvious because of the unfortunate slide colors is that it actually does reorder some data. It reorders it to be 64-bit aligned. and then 32 bits, and then some padding, and then some 64 bits. Um, and if you care about C compatibility, the alignment requirements seem to be the same if you put everything in this order. Maybe. Swift documentation says all over the place that data layouts are not guaranteed to be C data layouts. So there is an important caveat, though, which is don't do this stuff unless you need to. Swift compiler is taking care of reordering the data for you because it can, because it makes your life easier. But if you are a systems programmer, you are writing low-level code, you care a lot about your data layout. You care a lot about those extra nine instructions. You do not want those. So it's very important to understand that those can be generated and that there is, inside of Swift, an optimal data layout. Just like there is for almost all C sized struts. Um, in fact, there's something worth mentioning here, which is that uh, in Swift 4.2, they introduced the ability to generate PAC Swift struts, which are analogous to PAC C struts, struts without that extra padding, without the 64 bit alignment. But they also explicitly said that Swift PAC struts and Swift and C PAC struts are not identical. They do not have identical data labels. So, uh, one last thing for the next thing. Which is, let's go back to that init function thing where it looked like it was writing onto the stack and then it was writing a new object and returning that new object instead of what was on the stack. Structs are allocated on the stack. Functions have their own stack. Init is a function which is responsible for allocating itself. Init allocated a struct on the stack that had to return it to a different stack. So it had to put it on the stack, copy everything out of the stack into a generally memory, uh, memory addressable location, return that, and that's why you get the two, what looks like it's writing a struct twice. So there's actually a supplementary lesson here, which is trying to avoid returning structs from functions. Return stuff that goes on the heap. Um, this is actually a general lesson that C and C++ programmers for complicated data objects have known for a very long time. It's why in C++ everything tends to be on the heap, when in fact it would be much more efficient to have the majority of it on the stack. All right, well, we investigated the compiler artifacts. So what about the compiler itself? Well, there's this file called struct layout, which probably controls the data layout uh, I'm not going to pull it up in the interest of time and also your eyeballs. Uh, and instead what I'm going to say is this is public on GitHub. You can go read it. You can go search it. The actual class that we that does the building of the layouts for structs is called Struct Layout Builder. And what does it do? 
tracks the number of fields, tracks the overall size, tracks the alignment. Interestingly, it also tracks where spare bits are. The Swift team has on and off discussed using padding bits to store metadata, which is a very weird and questionable idea, but if it would be API locked, it would be fine, right? Like if your API defines that padding is going to have these bits in it when it's available, okay, cool. Uh, they decided against doing that, by the way. They said that it's too aggressive an optimization for right now. Um, it also is, if it's POD, plain old data, so just like regular data chilling out there, there's no functions, there's no special initializers, nothing. Uh, if the size of the struct is always fixed, there is such a thing as unfixed size structs, like for example, structs that would have witness tables in them because they have protocol objects but no concrete classes, etc. Um, but this implies that struct lab builder is also used for building classes, which is actually true because there's stuff in there for adding Objective-C headers and for bridging. So there is a single class in the Swift compiler that is responsible for determining the data layout of every possible complex data type that is not metadata. Cool. All right, this is only half the story though. ABI compatibility actually needs to be enforced by the actual struct generator. Struct gen. All right, so I went and I took a look at struct gen. Again, I'm going to spare your eyes. This is the file name. Uh, it's about, I think, like 3,000 lines of code. More complicated. Um, but the main thing that I took away from it is it looks like fields are tagged during processing somehow. It seems like fields may be tagged based on name name. They must be tagged with some kind of unique identifier, which is how Swift preserves the ordering guarantees. And also later I'm going to talk about how ABI compatibility includes the uh, ability to add and modify to add new public members without breaking ABI data layouts between library versions, which is insane. Uh, but it also implies that there's some certain type of data ordering that can be preserved based on name and angling and addressing. Uh, and actually, when I thought about it in Swift Intermediate Language, you saw how there was that command that was effectively like, for this struct, get the address of this member. That's probably the real point where the actual ABI uh, data layouts are being preserved and tagged. Uh, and we're starting to go down a real rabbit hole here, though, because init is a function, so it has to be handled by the function emission. The function emission code in the Swift compiler is, as you imagine, very huge, because it handles every function, not just initializes. It handles zero size function, it handles inlineable functions, it handles functions that could be inlineable, it handles functions that have C calling conventions, that have Swiss calling conventions, that have thick calling conventions, that have small, thin calling conventions, that have calling conventions, which is the next talk. So, calling conventions, how functions are called. Return registers, what registers are values returned in. Argument registers, what, argument, what registers are arguments passed in. Kali writable registers, these are called scratch registers, uh, which is the Kali is the function itself, the function that is currently operating. Which registers is it allowed to overwrite? Uh, and then what does the stack layout look like when you start a function? Functions, when they start, have something called a preamble, which is what sets up the stack space for that function, and it has something called a postamble, which tears down that stack space. Uh, and then, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes calling conventions include things like the red zone, which is a stack space that you're not allowed to write to because it crashes the operating system. Um, mock O is actually part of an ABI calling convention thing as well, and, but it's for the operating system loading, um, and so on and so on. Swift calling conventions, they're locked 100%. Swift calling conventions, as of today, as of Swift 4.2, locked 100%. Never going to change again. Awesome, with one small thing, <laughs> of course, because there's always one small thing, which is that there's an ongoing debate about should dynamic dispatch use V tables, those dynamic function tables that I mentioned a long time ago, or thunks. A thunk is a thinly generated function wrapper, hence thunk, thin function, where effectively what it does is it redirects your call into the actual function line. Thunks are actually how Objective-C routing works right now. 
When you have the at op c in front of a class, what it does is it generates a func for each function that is also tagged for op c. That func is callable from Objective-C. Within that function inside Swift, it massages your Objective-C data to be Swift readable, and then it massages the Swift outputs to be Objective-C readable. This is actually going to be significantly less complicated. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the calling convention as of today. Swift uses four registers for int return, which includes pointers, and three registers for float value returns. That is different from standard calling conventions. Standard calling conventions mandate that there is one return register for integers and pointers, one return register for floats. The reason for that is actually because Swift functions are designed to efficiently return objects, because 64-bit processors have a lot of registers on them. The existing calling conventions that say one register only for a return, that's because there used to not be very many registers. And four registers is really good for Swift because it turns out that quite frequently what you're returning from a Swift function is a pointer, probably some metadata along with that pointer, and potentially an exception. When you tag a function as throw, and you can look at this in Swift Intermediate language. What you're actually doing is telling a compiler, you don't return one thing, you actually return a tuple, a pair, where the second thing is an optional that holds an error. By the way, that's why Swift exception handling is very fast and not a bad thing. Um, other than this, they don't differ much from standard, well-documented, System 5 ABI calling conventions, which is very good. And in fact, Swift runtime is guaranteed to follow those calling conventions. What this means is you could call into the Swift runtime from any other language that supports the standard calling ABI on any platform, which is great. It means that Swift could actually be ported to any other language. You could theoretically write the Swift runtime in Java and no one would care. One well, people care. But, um, so just going to real quick go through what the Swift Intermediate language here looks like, because Swift Intermediate language contains all the information about all the calling conventions for all the functions that you created. Uh, I deeply apologize. There is no objects, Objective-C stuff or dynamic here, because I was building on a Linux x64 system, because I was very curious how that would work out. The answer is it doesn't work great. The foundation libraries don't build, so you can't do any of the Objective-C bridging. All right, we got this. We've got a really simple function up here. It turns it up. Just takes two integers and multiplies them and returns it. It's a good candidate for inlining. Then we have a class that has a couple of functions on it. It's got a static function. It's got a function that implicitly takes self as a parameter. And then it's got a function that returns self. So just a function that returns some more complex data. But they're all pretty small and simple. You guys are going to like the next slide, so I actually put some time into annotating this one. This is the Swift Intermediate language for the entire manifold. Like, all I did in this program was call each one of those functions once. But it turns out all the calling conventions are embedded in there. There's a little at convention. You see it? All the call command information is in cell. Show me those, show me those little red circles. All right. Hey, what's red circles? Red is a very good idea. Calling convention C for main. I mean, an operating system can call main because it follows the C calling conventions. Convention fin for the inlineable function. Oh, fin probably means it's a candidate for inline, but otherwise follows the standard calling conventions. Then there's this one where I call the static method. Oh, it follows the method calling conventions, and they're on a fit object. That probably means that uh, Swift makes a big distinction between what it considers thick and thin objects. Thick objects, I think, have much more metadata information associated with them. Which explains why it would be on a class instead of a thin one. Because there's, what? there's also a uh, calling convention on methods for what's called a guaranteed object, which means that this is a non nail object. Uh, so, if you're going to be an interesting property, in that, at least they're allowed to be 
doesn't have a concept of optional, because optional in Swift is just an enumeration, and Swift and Unity doesn't care about that. All the cool stuff you do with optionals in Swift is syntax sugar on top of working with enums, which you could probably do some really gross stuff with if you were me. All right, let's talk about library guarantees. We're getting towards the end here. So library guarantees are not the ABI themselves. They guide ABI design, which is important, because the library guarantees are telling library developers, I've already mentioned this a couple times, I'm going to mention it again. These are the things you are allowed to do to your library that will not break ABI they might break source compatibility, but they won't break ABI compatibility. ABI compatibility just means, oh, I can call this other thing. Source compatibility means I build against this other thing and it is guaranteed to be correct and consistent throughout different builds. So all non-public changes, implementations, labels, non-public members, those changes are generally allowed. There's a couple of exceptions. You're even allowed to add or remove non-public protocols without breaking ABI, which means that that information is stored probably separately in the witness table from all of the public information. It seems like Swift's ABI is going to be heavily segmented between this is the data space that indicates public data, this is the data space that indicates private data, which could actually just end up being two different data sections in a mockable object. To go back to that earlier talk today, which if you guys didn't go, make sure you watch the bot now. It's a great talk. Uh, default arguments appear to be called supplied caller side because the library guarantees explicitly say default arguments can change, they're ABI compatible, but they're source incompatible. What this implies is that my library function has a default argument, but I could change it at some future point. That default argument must be inserted at the call site. It's just copied there, it makes sense. Rather than supplying it in a caller, it's supposed to be the call -y. Uh, structs allow for member reordering, which was what that data layout segment was about, the investigating all the Swift intermediate language stuff. And it allows for removal of private information. If I remove private stuff from a struct, cool, we're good, it's still API compatible. If I remove some, if I remove something public, that's bad, that breaks. All right, those are the library guarantees I'm going to talk about. And now, very, very quickly, because this will probably end up being a full talk next year. I'm going to talk about lifetimes and ownership. This is the last major feature for Swift 5. Some people are saying, like, oh, async await in natural concurrency, green threads, whatever, are going to be the major feature for Swift 5. I don't even know if that's on their roadmap anymore. It's a big question for me. Uh, they are fully opt in for ex except for what they call exclusivity enforcement. This is the part where, if you're familiar with Rust, you're probably very happy. You, a developer, never have to worry about or care about lifetimes unless you really, really want to. So, there's this thing called the law of exclusivity, which is already enforced in Swift 4.2. Uh, the way that the, uh, the ownership manifesto document describes it is as this. If a storage reference expression evaluates to a storage reference that is implemented by a variable, then the formal access duration of that access may not overlap the formal access duration of any other access to the same variable unless both accesses are reads. Or, if you are a human, anyone can read memory unless it is being written to. Then only the writer can read it. So this goes back to that atomic kind of thing that I was talking about. Those atomic operations don't just say oh, well, I'm doing an atomic write, don't read while I'm writing. What they do is they say, I've claimed this object for an eventual write, no one read it. And then when it relinquishes that ownership, it says, okay, you're safe to read again now. I've guaranteed that I've finished all of my writing. And by the way, the reason why this is a problem is Swift has copy on write semantics, which we've probably run into at one point or another. If you pass like an array as an argument to a function, if that array could possibly be written to at some future point, Swift has to make a copy of it. Because otherwise you could be writing the same object at two different points. And also, that means everything is a copyable type. Sometimes it should be non-copyable. Some things should only exist as the one thing you instantiate them as. Um, there are entire programming paradigms that have been built around these concepts of lifetime and ownership that have been manually done by programmers since forever. 
in the C++ world, this showed up in the late 80s and early 90s as a thing called um, oh, RAII. Resource acquisition is initialization. The idea that when you acquire a resource, you initialize the data. All right. um, and that's related to lifetimes. Lifetimes are when is an object deallocated. And what we've done so far as developers of Injective C and Swift is we used to do manual memory management for ten release. Now ARC takes care of that for us. That's right. That's actually almost entirely all that the system is going to do. Uh, but also the law of exclusivity is important for one other thing, which is in out parameters right now, right? You can pass something as a value that can also be written to. What happens if I async dispatch a function with an in out parameter that runs for a long time, and then it runs concurrently with another function that tries to write into that value? Well, what we say then is the function that took the in out value owns it. It is responsible for it. And I've just gotten zero, so I'm going to finish up here real quick. Come back next year for hopefully a talk on that stuff in more detail. Very quickly, building a foreign function interface for Swift. Swift can call it to Objective-C and C fairly easily. C++ and maybe someday. They've been promising that since the beginning. Calling in Swift is much harder. You can do it through Objective-C. Cool. There's going to be a stable ABI, but none of the data layers see and calling conventions don't match our standard calling conventions. So what do we do? So here's the proposal that I have for this, which I think makes a lot of sense. The Swift runtime is guaranteed to follow the system calling conventions. It gets everything for us internally from witness tables, V tables. It probably includes data layout metadata. The problem is getting the data out of the runtime. So there's two options here. Two options for an FFI. Build a tool to parse public Swift interfaces and emit C structs and functions and translation code. This is what the opc decorator already does for Objective-C. The ship is probably sailed on this. Or create an intermediate interface language where you would write interfaces in that language and then you'd run some kind of tool on it and it would generate Swift code and C code for you. Uh, protocol buffers are actually a good candidate for this, believe it or not, if you're familiar with what those are. Which is how we get our foreign function interface. We probably have to write a full Swift evolution proposal, but those require you to actually like have an implementation. Um, my best advice at this point is be engaged with the developers and tell them what you want. You want an FFI. Help them figure it out. Because we want Swift everywhere. Swift is a great language. It should be running applications on every and there you go. Looks for the Thank you very much. I hope that you all enjoy it.